The waters of the Mississippi had been rising all through the month of January, swollen by the storms, driven by the wind into a restless grinding of current, and against every obstruction in their way. On a night of lashing sleet, in the first week of February, the Mississippi Bridge of the Atlantic Southern collapsed under a passenger train. The engine and the first five sleepers went down with the cracking girders into the twisting black spirals of water eighty feet below. The rest of the train remained on the first three spans of the bridge which held. "'You can't have your cake and let your neighbor eat it, too,' said Francisco d'Anconia. The fury of denunciations which the holders of public voices unleashed against him was greater than their concern over the horror at the river. It was whispered that the chief engineer of the Atlantic Southern, in despair over the company's failure to obtain the steel he needed to reinforce the bridge, had resigned six months ago, telling the company that the bridge was unsafe. He had written a letter to the largest newspaper in New York, warning the public about it. The letter had not been printed. It was whispered that the first three spans of the bridge had held, because they had been reinforced with structural shapes of Reardon metal. But five hundred tons of the metal was all that the railroad had been able to obtain, under the fair share law. As the sole result of official investigations, two bridges across the Mississippi belonging to smaller railroads were condemned. One of the railroads went out of business. The other closed a branch line, tore up its rail, and laid a track to the Mississippi Bridge of Taggart Transcontinental. So did the Atlantic Southern. The great Taggart Bridge at Bedford, Illinois, had been built by Nathaniel Taggart. He had fought the government for years because the courts had ruled on the complaint of river shippers that railroads were a destructive competition to shipping and thus a threat to the public welfare, and that railroad bridges across the Mississippi were to be forbidden as a material obstruction. The courts had ordered Nathaniel Taggart to tear down his bridge and to carry his passengers across the river by means of barges. He had won that battle by a majority of one voice on the Supreme Court. His bridge was now the only major link left to hold the continent together. His last descendant had made it her strictest rule that whatever else was neglected, the Taggart Bridge would always be maintained in flawless shape. The steel shipped across the Atlantic by the Bureau of Global Relief had not reached the people state of Germany. It had been seized by Ranyar Danischuld. But nobody heard of it outside the Bureau, because the newspapers had long since stopped mentioning the activities of Ranyar Danischuld. It was not until the public began to notice the growing shortage, then the disappearance from the market of electric irons, toasters, washing machines, and all electrical appliances, that people began to ask questions and to hear whispers. They heard that no ship loaded with Dunconia copper was able to reach a port of the United States. It could not get past Ranyar Danischuld. In the foggy winter nights on the waterfront, sailors whispered the story that Ranyar Danischuld always seized the cargoes of relief vessels, but never touched the copper. He sank the Dunconia ships with their loads. He let the crews escape in lifeboats, but the copper went to the bottom of the ocean. They whispered it as a dark legend beyond men's power to explain. Nobody could find a reason why Donischuld did not choose to take the copper. In the second week of February, for the purpose of conserving copper wire and electric power, a directive forbade the running of elevators above the twenty-fifth floor. The upper floors of the buildings had to be vacated, and partitions of unpainted boards went up to cut off the stairways. By special permit, exceptions were granted, on the grounds of essential need, to a few of the larger business enterprises and the more fashionable hotels. The tops of the cities were cut down. The inhabitants of New York had never had to be aware of the weather. Storms had been only a nuisance that slowed the traffic and made puddles in the doorways of brightly lighted shops. Stepping against the wind, dressed in raincoats, furs, and evening slippers, people had felt that a storm was an intruder within the city. Now, facing the gusts of snow that came sweeping down the narrow streets, people felt in dim terror that they were the temporary intruders and that the wind had the right of way. It won't make any difference to us now. Forget it, Hank. It doesn't matter, said Dagny, when Reardon told her that he would not be able to deliver the rail. He had not been able to find a supplier of copper. Forget it, Hank. He did not answer her. He could not forget the first failure of Reardon's steel. 
On the evening of February 15th, a plate cracked on a rail joint and sent an engine off the track half a mile from Winston, Colorado, on a division which was to have been relayed with the new rail. The station agent of Winston sighed and sent for a crew with a crane. It was only one of the minor accidents that were happening in his section every other day or so. He was getting used to it. Reardon that evening, his coat collar raised, his hat slanted low over his eyes, the snowdrifts rising to his knees, was tramping through an abandoned open-pit coal mine in a forsaken corner of Pennsylvania, supervising the loading of pirated coal upon the trucks which he had provided. Nobody owned the mine. Nobody could afford the cost of working it. But a young man with a brusque voice and dark, angry eyes who came from a starving settlement had organized a gang of the unemployed and made a deal with Reardon to deliver the coal. They mined it at night. They stored it in hidden culverts. They were paid in cash with no questions asked or answered. Guilty of a fierce desire to remain alive, they and Reardon traded like savages, without rights, titles, contracts, or protection, with nothing but mutual understanding and a ruthlessly absolute observance of one's given word. Reardon did not even know the name of the young leader. Watching him at the job of loading the trucks, Reardon thought that this boy, if born a generation earlier, would have become a great industrialist. Now he would probably end his brief life as a plain criminal in a few more years. Dagny, that evening, was facing a meeting of the Taggart Board of Directors. They sat about a polished table in a stately boardroom which was inadequately heated. The men who, through the decades of their careers, had relied for their security upon keeping their faces blank, their words inconclusive, and their clothes impeccable, were thrown off key by the sweaters stretched over their stomachs, by the mufflers wound about their necks, by the sound of coughing that cut through the discussion too frequently, like the rattle of a machine gun. She noted that Jim had lost the smoothness of his usual performance. He sat with his head drawn into his shoulders, and his eyes kept darting too rapidly from face to face. A man from Washington sat at the table among them. Nobody knew his exact job or title, but it was not necessary. They knew that he was the man from Washington. His name was Mr. Weatherby. He had graying temples, a long, narrow face, and a mouth that looked as if he had to stretch his facial muscles in order to keep it closed. This gave a suggestion of primness to a face that displayed nothing else. The directors did not know whether he was present as the guest, the advisor, or the ruler of the board. They preferred not to find out. It seems to me, said the chairman, that the top problem for us to consider is the fact that the track of our main line appears to be in a deplorable, not to say critical, condition. He paused, then added cautiously, while the only good rail we own is that of the John Colt, I mean the Rio Norte line. In the same cautious tone of waiting for someone else to pick up the intended purpose of his words, another man said, if we consider our critical shortage of equipment, and if we consider that we are letting it wear out in the service of a branch line running at a loss. He stopped and did not state what would occur if they considered it. In my opinion, said a thin, pallid man with a neat mustache, the Rio Norte line seems to have become a financial burden which the company might not be able to carry. That is, not unless certain readjustments are made, which... He did not finish, but glanced at Mr. Weatherby. Mr. Weatherby looked as if he had not noticed it. Jim, said the chairman, I think you might explain the picture to Mr. Weatherby. Taggart's voice still retained a practiced smoothness, but it was the smoothness of a piece of cloth stretched tight over a broken glass object, and the sharp edges showed through once in a while. I think it is generally conceded that the main factor affecting every railroad in the country is the unusual rate of business failures. Why, we all realize, of course, that this is only temporary still, for the moment. It has made the railroad situation approach a stage that may well be described as desperate. Specifically, the number of factories which have closed throughout the territory of the Taggart Transcontinental System is so large that it has wrecked our entire financial structure. Districts and divisions, which had always brought us our steadiest revenues, are now showing an actual operating loss. A train schedule geared to a heavy volume of freight cannot be maintained for three shippers, where once there had been seven. We cannot give them the same service, at least not at 
our present rates. He glanced at Mr. Weatherby, but Mr. Weatherby did not seem to notice. It seems to me, said Taggart, the sharp edges becoming sharper in his voice, that the stand taken by our shippers is unfair. Most of them have been complaining about their competitors and have passed various local measures to eliminate competition in their particular fields. Now, most of them are practically in sole possession of their markets, yet they refuse to realize that a railroad cannot give to one lone factory the freight rates which had been made possible by the production of a whole region. We are running our trains for them at a loss, yet they have taken a stand against any raise in rates. Against any raise? said Mr. Weatherby mildly, with a good imitation of astonishment. That is not the stand they have taken. 